Hi, you're watching Privateer MX TV. We're at Doug Henry's house, and uh, we're gonna do a little interview with Doug. So, right off the bat, I'm gonna ask uh, Doug, how is your family, and how are you doing? Everybody's good, thanks. Uh, kids are healthy. My wife's doing very well uh, with her illness, and uh, I'm I'm doing good. I'm getting, not really getting much better than where I was, but. I can't complain because I got I have a lot going for me and I'm still able to do just about everything I love to do. So uh, it's going good. Starting from the beginning, where uh, where did you start racing, and uh, when did you start racing? I'd have to say in 1984 we bought a, I bought a new YZ80, uh, Libby's Yamaha in New Haven, and uh, I saw a, a race schedule on the counter. So my dad and I were looking at it, and we sort of said, hey, there's a, there's a race in Southwick, Massachusetts. Let's go take a look at it and see if something we want to do. So we went up there and we watched uh, one weekend, and uh, I saw kind of, I kind of guessed whereabouts I, I would be. And uh, we went and talked to some of the riders that I figured I'd be racing against, some of the kids on the 80s, and just to see what it was like, and some of the dads. And, and uh, I think two weeks later was another Southwick, so we signed up, and that's how we got started. I've heard a lot of stories that you didn't win much uh, when you're in the C and B classes. Is that true? I don't know where you heard those stories from because I was winning all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I str I struggled, but then once I got the knack, the hang of it, I, I kind of moved up pretty fast. Uh, it seemed like. When I was a novice, I, actually I started out pretty good. In the 80s I was running pretty far back early on. I think I got a couple of trophies though the first year. And then when I moved up to the 125 class, uh, I was I broke my arm the first race so that, that wasn't very good. And then I think I turned from amp, from novice to amateur that same year. So I won, I won my races that I needed to win to, to move up. and. Uh, I'll have to take you to my trophy collection. I mean, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll change your opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> Not my opinion. <laughs> um, when did you realize that you wanted to, uh, you had a shot at the pro level, and did you think you could make a living at racing? I realized that th this might be something I can make a living at. Probably my second year with Honda. Uh, I, I didn't. People usually were surprised that I thought that. I never knew how far it was going to take me. I sort of took off on the road. 1990, I went down to Florida to do the Winter Series, and I basically didn't come home. I just talked to other privateers. They're like, "Where are you going?" You know, you gonna start to follow. Did the Orlando Supercross, and a couple other events, Atlanta Supercross, and a couple of the other guys were saying, "You guys going out to Oklahoma? You going? You going? You going to Dallas?" And ended up just following them and followed the racing circuit and just didn't know when it was going to end and after I after my second year at Honda I figured you know I'm, I'm doing pretty good you know I think I can I can win some races in 91 at Hangtown you won your first national in the mud uh, give me a little about how that day went really uh, you think you were gonna win or? oh no I, I didn't think I was gonna win that, that race out there I I don't consider my People say, oh, Henry loves the mud, Henry loves the mud. I don't. I just do well in it. <laughs> and, and I thrive on the fact that people hate it. Uh, some people just despise the mud, don't like racing in the mud. I deal with it. Uh, being in New England, I've had many opportunities where I didn't want to ride in the mud, but trying to follow a championship, win a championship, you had to race in the mud. So there was no, there was no getting out of it. You, you had to go and race in the mud. So when Hangtown came around, and, being a privateer, it was uh, it was tough. It was it was so good that at the time Duke Finch was the head referee, and he decided that we were just going to do a one moto format because the factory guys may get a chance to get their bikes ready for the second moto, but there was no way that we would be able to do it. So they changed it to a one one moto format, and uh, you know we we ran our practice the day before. We may have run some in the morning, and uh, it just the skies opened up and it was just pouring rain. And they they offered a parade lap, but I was like, this 
nothing to see out there. It's just a mess, you know. They just learn the track when you first go out there. So uh, I got off to a def decent start and kind of ran in there. And guys are they got a couple guys past me, but then they'd fall. And yeah. guys were out in front, and I was catching up to them and passed a couple of good guys out there. And I was just kind of running my own race and trying to keep the bike alive because there was there was a it was in a valley and it was just a river running across the valley and in one section you entered at the right side of the track and you exited through the water on the left side and yeah. <laughs> I guess she took the bone yeah, and <laughs> well the other one's buried somewhere hopefully they'll they'll stop but uh, okay so the the it was in a valley and one side was it was real narrow so the water was just just gushing really hard and and like I said you'd enter on the right side and exit on the left and once in a while you'd see a hay bale floating down you had to kind of avoid and on the other section it was a really really long long mud area and you'd have to wheelie through it and keep your front end up so it didn't get suck water you know Hey, get that thing out of the shot. What are you kidding me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now you're actually good there. Kawasaki. Did that win make you feel like you actually like belonged up front and that you built your confidence that you could win races? The win wasn't a big it wasn't a big confidence booster because everybody's saying, oh, it was because it was muddy, it was because it was muddy, it was because it was muddy. But I beat a lot of good guys there and it felt good. And uh, we worked on my, it was actually my brother-in-law and I, uh, he was my mechanic at the time with DGY Yamaha, and we were in a little Astro van, and uh, it was just a, 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 it was a great feeling when we left that place. Here, you know, we're in a little minivan and we beat everybody, and it was an awesome feeling, and it was right around, I believe it was right around Easter, because we weren't planning on coming, going home for Easter, but we were just so high on that win that we're like let's just go for it let's just drive home spend a couple days at home because we hadn't been home in a while and uh, surprise everybody when we come home and we didn't realize that higher elevations were getting snow so as we tried to leave we were driving up and I <laughs> dog down don't look at it <laughs> uh, so we were we were leaving we're trying we're gonna drive through the night and we get up to this mountain pass and it says chains required so we don't have chains we don't have anything like that so we try to pull in to this gas station asking for chains looking for chains couldn't find anything so then we're like well let's just get a hotel we can't we can't drive we can't go over the mountain so all the hotels are booked and everything so we talked to these guys that are in the gat, they were at the station, and we're trying to tell them, ask them, you know, hey, you know where we get some chains? But oh no, nothing's nothing's open. Sunday night, we just finished the national. So like, hey, you come stay with us, or, or it started out as as, uh, hey, can you help us out? We just won the national and stuff, and they're like, come on, you know, there's no way, there's no way you won this race, and. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so we, we had the trophy, we had the first place trophy, and they're like, you beat Guy Cooper? Uh, that that was, must have been their hero at the time. I said, yeah, he was because he was racing that race, at the, he was racing 125s, I guess, that year. And I said, yeah, yeah, we, we did it, and here's the trophy and stuff. And you know, They still didn't believe us, but we ended up staying at their house. We had a great time. They, the guy had some chains in his basement and stuff. So uh, we ended up spending the night and put the chains on the next day, and, the way we went, took, took, took the DGY van, we drove all the way home, just nonstop. <laughs> uh, once you signed with Honda, did everything change for you? Like, or was it just, just you had better bikes? Or did your life change, or in 93? Well, once I went with Honda, uh, my attitude changed. I kinda, I knew I had the best equipment, 
at the time, and um, the effort that a factory team puts in to win a race is a lot more than I ever thought. My first test session with Honda, I had probably 12 guys on my bike. That's, that's what was allotted to the project of the 125 National and 125 East Coast Series. So it's not that they put a lot of pressure on you, but you put a lot of pressure on yourself because it feels like you're no longer winning for yourself anymore. You're winning for all these people. So uh, I think my training just increased. Uh, my confidence increased with the, with the bike. And the, the, the facilities that I had to use, the Honda, Honda Land, they had a couple different tracks there. And the ability to fine tune the motorcycle, to make it for me. It's not that the, the, the work bikes were, they, they, were, they were definitely better. But the best thing about a factory bike is fine-tuning it to you, to your individual needs. And that, that's what I learned was very beneficial. I learned that at an early stage that the better I know this bike, the better I make it, the easier it's going to be for me to win. And I really focused on, on my equipment uh, more than I did in the past. Did it elevate your confidence at all with, once you hopped onto the factory team? When I jumped on the factory team, it, the, the confidence was there. Uh, probably as soon as they asked me to be on the team, just knowing that somebody else thinks I'm not going to do good, that was that was very make, gave, gave me confidence. Fast forward to the 1995 season. Uh, how was your career going up until that point? About, about turning over to the outdoors. Uh, it was great. Uh, I think in 1995 I had just won the my first Supercross at Dallas. I had a good good run there, and then I went to Mount Morris. To, we went to the outdoor season, and uh, I felt confident uh, riding the 250. My first year on the 250, two stroke, and uh, went to Mount Morris. I, I'm not sure how my first races went. Probably not great, but I know after Mount Morris, I think I was right in the points hunt. I was probably second place, maybe first or second at the time, so I'd just come off the Mount Morris win and then the accident of Bud's Creek where, uh, where it, that, that changed a lot that day. <laughs> Every fan that I uh, asked to provide me with questions or about you, stuff like that, nine out of ten of them wanted to know uh, what you were thinking when you were in the air. Well, uh, when I was in the air, I guess if you got the time, I'll go back to the corner before, because that's where it all started, okay? I screwed up a little bit on this corner before, and two laps ago, LaRocco's not that far ahead of me, in my mind. He's not, he's not really that far. I, there's a chance I can catch up to him. And uh, I screwed up that corner before, and it's like, I gotta make up that little bit of missed time that I, that I lost, a fraction of a second. So I, I, I drove down before now what's known as Henry Hill, and drove down that hill faster than I had before, and it was kind of like a little drop in the G out. The hill went down and back up, but halfway down they had like a water cut, and uh, I just I just bottomed out on that thing. And there were the ruts were so bad, it dragged me, it dragged my foot peg, my feet off the foot pegs. So I had a I had maybe a half a second to decide, probably less, but I, I had a little bit of time to decide should I jump off the bike and go off this jump separated from the bike or should I pull myself back up and get control of the bike and at least I, I know I could land it uh, but I know I'm going to be way out in La La Land so for a second there I thought I just might be able to make it to the lake there's a big <laughs> pond which was another three times as far as where I went but I was thinking maybe I'll make it <laughs> uh, and then I went over and I jumped and I launched and I, I just felt like a dream I just thought you know, wasn't real. I thought it was. Uh, thought I was going to hit, and right as soon as I hit, I was going to wake up. <laughs> Just one of those things where I, I've had dreams where I'm way up in the air doing something, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you fall and you wake up. But uh, I realized in the hospital that that it was for real. At the end of the '95 season, uh, you 
you know, you're coming back from the, the healing up and stuff like that, and then uh, you switched over to Yamaha. Was that because Honda didn't offer you a contract, or was it because Yamaha offered you something better, or how'd that go? Uh, when I went into the, the to discuss the following year's contract, um, I was in the room with uh, the upper management at Honda, and what it all comes down to, I mean, there was a lot of things said that I wasn't really happy about, but basically, I don't think they thought I could win again. And uh, with their attitude, I just was like, okay, you know, I'm done. You know, I, I don't want to ride for a company, risk, you know, risk everything for someone who doesn't think I can do it. You know, I, I, want, I need somebody to believe in me. And uh, I had a good relationship with John Rosensteel, John R. at Yamaha. He was the suspension guy for a long time. And I had a really good relationship with him. When I won in 1993, my first outdoor championship, he called me into the hotel and said, Hey, Doug, I just want to congratulate you. Great, great job this year. And that meant, that meant a real lot to me. And uh, so after the Honda thing, I wasn't happy. I didn't like leave on bad terms or anything with Honda. I just had a bad taste in my mouth and just didn't, didn't, didn't like it. I just I felt like that's not what I that's not that's not the company I wanted to race for anymore. And I called up John John R and I said, Hey, you know, I'm not sure what you guys got going on for next year, but uh, I want you to know that I'd love to, you know, have another shot at riding the Yamaha because in ninety three I want I really was looking to ride the Yamaha but the, the team was full. And uh, um, so he I guess spoke to Keith or whoever it, whoever he was needed to speak to and I think it was actually Larry Griffiths at the time and uh, they said you know come let's uh, let me let us we want you to see our doctor and if he says everything's okay then you know definitely and we put together a, a package and uh, it was more on a bonus incentive thing and I was fine with that I I was never I was never afraid of working for the <laughs> Hey, come here. Eli, come on. Eli, stop barking. When it seemed like Honda uh, didn't believe in you anymore, did you feel like bitter or sad or like, you know, like let down by the, that whole thing with Honda? Like, since they didn't believe in you anymore? Yeah, I, I felt bad because uh, I knew what Honda stood for in, uh, in Japan. I got to race over there. I met a lot of really nice people over there. And uh, seeing some videos of Mr. Honda and how he got started, and uh, I just felt bad that these were the guys that were picking his race team at the time. I just I felt bad. I felt like I was I was what Mr. Honda wanted in a rider and what he believed in with racing. And uh I just just uh I I I just didn't agree with the management at the time. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> <clears throat> when you when you signed over to uh to Yamaha uh did you know about the four-stroke being developed at the time? In 1996, I didn't know about the four-stroke uh, early on. I knew when it was come time to 1997 was to, uh, they asked me if I wanted to ride it. And I was very, very scared at the time. I remember like it was yesterday, uh, just Keith McCarty invited me over to his house. He said he wanted to talk about you know, the contract for next year. And I sat on his, on his couch in his living room. And he said, we want you to ride a four-stroke. And just my heart stopped. And I was, just felt like I had just struggled so hard to get that win at Washougal in 1996 that I didn't, I didn't want to struggle like that again. Uh, I didn't know what this thing was going to do. Four-stroke, you know, I, uh, is, that, is that thing any good? Is it going to be any, you know, I didn't know at the time. So they said that uh, it was going to be a full works bike. And uh, I came home and and talked to some family and some friends and decided to go for it. You know, let's just 
let's just try it and see see what happens. You know, it's it, if I don't win, well, it could be the bike, and if I do win, hey, it could be the bike. You know, that's great. You know, that's great for for Yamaha and everybody else. I I always wanted to do well for the companies that I rode for because I knew that's that's what my job was was to make that bike look good. I didn't care how I looked. <laughs> All right, halfway th halfway through the '97 uh, Supercross season, you looked like uh, you were the one to win the championship. Uh, right around, you had a couple wins going into the '97 season, right? And then, uh, and then you broke your hand. Uh, do you think you could have won that title, or do you think you would have won that title if you didn't get hurt? Or what do you what, looking back at that? If you didn't get hurt, what do you think? I would have won it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I felt really comfortable. It was my best Supercross season on 250. And who knows, it was a, a lot of guys were struggling. Jeremy was struggling with his new ride. Um, Amig was riding good. I think he would have been the, I guess they both came down to the last race, but I think there's a good chance that I would have been in that uh, championship hunt at the end. Yeah, because you had a decent, like, you had a lead. You were, you were leading it, right? I mean, you were leading the points at the time before when you broke your hand. I think I was. I think yeah. I was right in first or second. It was a very, very uh, close series, but I think I had won maybe five or six that year. I, I'm not exactly sure. When you came back to Vegas at the end of the year in 97 uh, on the four-stroke, that was your first race on the four-stroke, uh, did you know after you won the race that uh, you had just changed the whole future of motocross and the whole, with the whole four-stroke revolution and things like that? I didn't know at the time right after the race that I had, that things had changed. But I did know the following season when Yamaha came out with the production 400 and <laughs> so many guys that were four-stroke fans, I, mean, I just I just got this whole new fan base, that, that guys that just four-strokes. I, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I, I don't mean to say it this way, but I felt like the guys, it was kind of like the guys came out of the closet in a way. These, these guys were four-stroke fans, but, you know, two-strokes were just so dominant. So if you said you, loved, you, you liked riding four-strokes, you know, they, people may, maybe made fun of you or something. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it was just great. It just had all these new fans that were just, like, so into the four-stroke. I, I never really was into a four-stroke. I, I, I did it for fun. Whenever I rode a four-stroke, I was riding because I was doing wheelies, riding a little track or riding through the woods. When I was on a two-stroke, I always had to go fast. I always had to race, had to train. So the four-stroke thing was like really, really fun for me. Never really uh, put a lot of effort into it. And then when we did, it just seemed like having, having uh, that fan base, it was awesome. These guys were just so psyched to see that bike out on the track winning. Did you ever think that uh motocross was just going to be all four strokes and the two strokes would stop manufacturing altogether pretty much? I mean, they're non-existent on the starting line nowadays. I knew it would impact the sport, but not the way it did. Not, not as much as it has. Uh, I think Yamaha was taking a big chance coming out with a four stroke. And I think they did their homework and they came out at the right time. And, and uh, it kind of put you know Yamaha four strokes on the map. I mean, they they started this thing and they're, you know, especially with the bike coming out this year, that new 2010 450, it's just, it's an amazing piece of equipment. I just can't, can't wait to get my hands on one. Uh, but they're definitely, they definitely moved ahead with the four stroke industry. In the 98 Nationals, uh, you put it all together, you won the championship. Uh, how does that rank? in like uh, everything that you won with your championships and that, how special was that one knowing that it was like the first four stroke to win the championships and uh, where does that like list on your level of like achievements that you've achieved? Uh, I would say that the winning the 1998 championship was probably probably on probably on top actually because I had come back from such adversity with a broken back uh, it was uh you know, you asked me if I was bitter about what had happened previously, and uh, it was bittersweet, <laughs> that championship <laughs> right there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was big. That was big for me. 
So, so you reached a kind of like a retirement tour, and then you switched over uh, to snowcross. And uh, was it hard for you to adapt to snowcross? A lot of people thought you would dominate, but that didn't really happen. Uh, do you feel you could have done things different to succeed more at snowcross, or what was really happening there? I think with snowcross, uh, if I had stayed in it a little bit longer, I would have uh, got the hang of it a little bit more. Uh, I went to snowcross right off of motocross because of I didn't want the grueling schedule of motocross anymore. So I said, oh, eight races a year, snowcross, yeah, that, that, that should be fun. But eight races uh, doesn't mean you're away from home eight weekends. Finding snow was a challenge going all over the place so it was, it was, I felt like I was just kind of right back into the grind of things again and uh, and I didn't keep pursuing it. The biggest thing with, with the uh, with snowcross for me was getting used to a, a line that was this big instead of this big and just using your peripheral vision to see the track in a different way and uh, and learning the machine it was a whole new whole new thing, learning the machine, turning and steering and suspension settings and, and all that stuff. Uh, I had a really good time with it and, and it's, it was, I still snow cross to this day. I, I love riding snowmobiles. Uh, it's just, it was just, I was just burnt out on the travel and I just felt like I threw myself back into it too soon. So it was kind of like, it was kind of like you just kind of like hopped into the pro ranks of snow cross with just kind of like doing trails and stuff like that, so it wasn't like you were, you'd been doing snow cross forever, so you were going into the pro level, so it wasn't like, it was kind of like almost like your first couple years in doing snow cross, right? I mean, it wasn't, you kind of just hopped into the pro level, and that's why it was, the winds didn't come flying in and stuff like that. Do you think that's why? or? Uh, for me, to, I wanted to improve with snow cross. I wanted to race with the, the top guys, and uh, I improved every weekend. I felt like I was getting better every weekend and uh, I could have raced the amateur circuit maybe for for a year but I don't know I just, I'd rather just jump right in there and yeah. and ride with the best guys out there sure. now then everything switches over to supermoto and uh, relatively new sport in America and you seem to pick that up like right away uh, tell me how you got into doing that and then kind of like went right into winning it almost seemed like you know, I, I went to, I went up to Keith, Keith McCarty when I was riding motocross. I had kind of retired from motocross and snowcross. And I said, hey, at the end of the year, can you save one of your R6s? Because I had some friends that used to go up to Loudon and they do, did track days. They went, on, went up there for the track days. And I used to hear the stories and it sounded like a lot of fun. So I said, hey, can you, you know, save me one and I'll buy it at the end of the year. And uh, probably two months later, Keith McCarty called me up and said, hey, do you want to try Supermoto? I said, what's Supermoto? He said, well, it's, it's like super bikers. You know, it's a dirt bike with street bike wheels. And uh, I said, sure, I'll give it a shot. You got any videos so I can see what I'm getting into here? And he sent me some videos and stuff. And, and he had a guy who was, uh, who kind of had his own team. He wanted to, he had his own team and he was looking for a rider. And uh, it was a Yamaha, so I jumped in with him in the first year. And, I had a blast, but to, to go back to how I picked it up quickly, I, Jeff Ward laughed at me the first race because I was taking motocross lines. He's like, he's like, hey, he said, you got to run the corners a little bit wider. He said, you, you're going in, you know, you're diving straight in, turning, straight, turn. He said, you got to flow a little bit more. So I uh, took his advice and, and uh, you know, learned how to run a corner. I, I always thought to myself, what's, what's with an asphalt corner? Well, how hard is it to go around a corner? With no braking bumps, no ruts, no whoops, you know, how hard can it be? I learned. I learned that it's difficult to to hit your marks all the time and the apex of the corner and coming in and sliding and drifting and getting on the power not too fast, not too not too hard, not too light, and just learning the the uh, the finesse of, of riding a super motorbike. And I enjoyed it. It was all new learning to me. Going back, going back to the day where you got really hurt and if you don't want to talk about it that's fine but uh if you do uh can you go through that day with me like what happened because i've heard stories that a rider's bike blew up and you slipped on his antifreeze and i've heard
just crazy stories that, and none of them, I don't really believe any of them until I hear from you. Uh, well, I guess it, we, I was down in New Smyrna. It was uh, like a warm-up race for our Supermoto series. It wasn't a part of Bike Week, but it was, uh, was kind of close. It wasn't a full AMA race. It was just an amateur event. And I wanted to go down there and do some motocross and do some Supermoto and just have some fun. So I went down to Ocala the week before. I won that. I felt really good there. And went to New Smyrna. And they had a practice. It was a practice day. It was the day before the race, I believe it was. Yeah, I think it was the day before the race. And uh, we were just warming up, practicing. And, and um, I did one lap. And actually, the first lap, some guy in front of me had crashed. He had slid out. And he slid all the way up about 20 feet from the wall. And on the first lap with supermoto bikes, if your tires are cold, it's it's almost like riding on ice. So I'm I'm thinking to myself, oh, he, uh, you know, maybe he was out there with cold tires, slid out, and, and that was happened. And next, didn't think much about it. Next lap, I came around, and on the face of the jumps in the dirt section, I saw a little bit of like splatter. But riding, coming from motocross, you're saying to yourself, oh, it's somebody's carburetor when they hit the face of the jumps you know fills up fuel dumps out the sides and uh, and later on I kind of put all the pieces together in the hospital uh, I think one of the guys had blown a shock uh, I think it was a quad guy because I remember sitting in the van hey you guys got a shock for a quad I'm like no oh, I don't have one and and uh, it's not you know not, not putting any blame on him at all because quads don't race supermoto that much they don't know the, the danger of putting a little bit of oil on the track. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure that, like, so the next lap I came around and I came into the corner a lot faster. I had hot tires and I was, but I was clear. I had a clear track ahead of me. It was the funnest corner on the track for me. It was probably a 80 mile an hour or so, like left hand turn, just awesome first turn real fast. And I, I from riding at Loudon on supermoto bikes, I got used to the real fast stuff. So I just came into the turn and I tucked the front, and um, it was a left-hand turn. So I tucked the front and my front started grabbing. So now I'm spinning, going backwards up towards the wall, and my leg was stuck under the bike and I was kind of trying to pull it out to to get from the other side, but I just didn't get out in time and I just got squished between the bike and the wall. And right there, I I knew as soon as I hit, I couldn't move, couldn't feel nothing, was in a lot of pain. And uh, I knew that that was it. I said, this is, uh, I cried. I just, I couldn't believe it was over. And uh, moved on from there. I, I had, that wasn't the most, that wasn't the roughest time of my life. It was in the hospital, realizing it. You know, when you first get hurt, you think that you're gonna be okay. And, uh, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, when I couldn't even roll over in bed by myself, I said, "Jesus, you know, this is this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life." You know, just so so dependent. It was uh, it's just real sad. I was just that, that was probably the lowest lowest point in my my life was in the hospital, not being able to roll over, and uh, Now, when people try to help me, I, I really enjoy the help, but I enjoy it more when I can do something on my own. I mean, when, I, when we were driving around and we're talking and, and stuff, and I kind of, I try not to say it too much, but it's really, it's really awesome when I could do something on my own and not have to rely on other people. And uh, that's why I, I, I put a lot of effort into building something set up to where I just need somebody to put my bike here and I'm good. You know, I love that. I, I, I love the fact that that I could almost ride by myself. <laughs> so switching gears, uh, what do you think about the current state of motocross right, racing right now? I don't follow it. <laughs> I, I really I don't sort of I follow a little bit, but I know the economy is hitting everybody, and and um, I I don't I just don't don't seem to follow it. I I'll watch some of the supercrosses online, or or just get it off of a, a website and 
I usually don't watch the video itself. I usually just watch the lap times and the practice times and heat times and then I watch the main event and the lap chart and figure out, I kind of put all the pieces together. Uh, we don't, I, I don't have, I don't, I didn't run cable up here so I just have an antenna and internet and that's, so you don't, keep don't really, really yeah. <laughs> close following, huh? Yeah, I like, I, I, I'll follow MotoGP and, and uh, World Superbike but I don't know, the motocross thing, I just, I keep my ears open, I hear enough from my friends. Well, that kind of, <laughs> cancels out my next 10 questions. Because <laughs> I was going to ask you about what do you think about some of the different riders and stuff like that and uh, like the salaries. Oh, I do want to ask you about that. Um, nowadays, the salaries are real high, you know, generally. I mean, last year, the last couple of years, they were generally high, you know, guys like, uh, you know, first year pros and stuff signing million dollar contracts and all that stuff like that. Um, or, you know what I mean, but by... They're much higher than they were when you signed with your Honda in '93. Yep. Um, so uh, nowadays, uh, a rider they can win like about a hundred thousand dollars if they win a 250F main event. You know, uh, in '93 when you won your first Supercross event, that was '93. I'm pretty sure. Uh, what What do you think you made? Like uh, roughly, like what do you think you made for from Honda from your first win? I think between all my sponsors, when I when I won a race, maybe ten thousand. I'm thinking something like that. And that was in the beginning or towards the end? That was like the that was the beginning. That's I'd say. Beginning. Yeah. Yeah. At the end, I don't. I don't really know. I, I I guess at the end was I was doing well with with my winnings towards the end with, with my last year on the on the uh, on the 400, 426 at the time. Uh, my retirement year, I only won just the one race, uh, but I mean, I probably made maybe forty-five, fifty. <laughs> you know, that was yeah. that was that was a ton for me. You know, yeah, that sure. Was, that was what I wanted. Battery. Let's go. Cool. We're, we're right in between it. We're almost done. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite I think it's great. I, I think it's great that these guys are making that money. You know, Can you believe it? I, I I think it's awesome. A lot of people follow it. A lot of people love it, and uh, I think it's. I, I think maybe maybe some of it should go more towards incentive, <laughs> instead of just salary. Uh, but that's just my opinion. That's that's kind of how I kind of ran my career was was that way. Uh, it just gave me a little more drive to to win and, and to do good. But I, I think if the money's out there, you know, these guys are deserving of making it because it's, it's a tough sport. So do you think uh, the riders nowadays, do you think that, are, so say, for instance, if they sign like a, a million dollar contract, do you think they're, that they should get more than that? Or do you think that's like good? Or do you think it should be less? Or I know you like the, the bonus incentives, which I think, that's what I agree with too. But uh, do you think they should be getting paid more because it's, they take such a risk? You know, much more than say like a baseball sport or something like that. You know, where you know guys don't drop like flies like they do in motocross. You know, and uh, do you think they should be getting paid more or less, like with that type of thing? Uh, I think that the stadiums are full. A lot of the nationals have a lot of people if the weather's good. <laughs> uh, and uh, a million doesn't sound. It's a lot of money. And if the money's there, I think it should go to the riders, not not necessarily to. I mean, the promoters, being a promoter for myself for the year, I, I think uh, they should get some of it. But I think the riders are the one out there taking the risk, and, and they should be making the, the, the bulk of the money. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so now you're back to riding again, and you got this new bike. Uh, tell me how about how that all came about with the new. But then, uh, old cage bike and all this. Well, it all started <laughs> in the hospital. Uh, probably uh, it couldn't have been much more than a week after my injury or so. Uh, somebody told me to check out this video, Ricky James. He's a kid who's paralyzed and he rides. And I, I watched the video and I said, wow, that, you know, I just thought it was awesome. I, I said, I want to do that. You know, it looks like looks like a lot of fun. I'm not in a rush to do it. I'm not not in a big hurry, but I know it's there, 
and Sarah, when, I, when I'm ready, I can, I can do this. And I uh, spoke to my wife, of, co of course, first, <laughs> and thought what she, you know, kind of, actually we were skiing, and I remember going up the lift, I took my son up there, and I said, I said, hey Ian, I said, what do you think? I think it'd be all right if I, what do you think about me riding a dirt bike again? Would you be okay with that? He's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And I took my daughter up, and uh, she was on the lift with me. I said, hey, Brianna, what do you think about me riding dirt bikes again? She said, yeah, that'd be great. I think it'd be, you know, it'd be good. So then I went up with my wife and chickened out. <laughs> and then went up again and chickened out again. So the next time, because I was thinking of how I didn't just know how to break it to her. And, uh, and when I did say it, she... Uh, she said, I knew it was coming, you know, I knew, you know, she goes, I knew before you did that you were going to be riding again. And uh, she was kind of, I think she was kind of ready for me to ask her eventually, so she had her, her speech all prepared. She told me what she thought, I said, oh, there's some positives in there. And I just went with it and talked to my cousin and said, uh, I said, hey, let's, let's build a bike. You got room in your garage this winter, we'll start putting this thing together and and uh, go with it so my cousin Rick his neighbor John was is a machinist and he uh, it was great working there because with his neighbor being a machinist he had a little bit of tools in his garage a little bit of equipment laid and stuff where he can whip stuff up real quick and what he couldn't do he was able to get some stuff done at work and, and so we ordered the parts and just started working on it. Each Wednesday I'd go down there and we'd do a little bit more to it, a little bit more to it. And uh, we needed a roll cage and I contacted the OCC to see if they would be interested in building a cage. And at the time they were getting ready for a big open house and they're like, oh, I don't think we'd be able to get to it for a couple weeks. And uh, I was, at the time I was Jones and I'm like, I wanna go, wanna get this thing started. So uh, I did some, I checked out some fabricators and like roll cages for cars and, and they sort of specifically stuck with cars. They had their jigs made and this is what they did. They said, oh, check the, check the guys next door. They build the bobsleds for the U.S. bobsled team. I said, perfect. That's, you know, so I checked that out and they said, no, we're, it's an Olympic, we're getting ready for an Olympic year and, and uh, uh, you know, we don't really have the time here. Here's a guy up in Torrington who's, who's very, very good at it. So uh, I, got the, I got his name and and uh, I didn't have a telephone number, but I knew where he was. So I went and uh, stopped at his shop a couple times. He wasn't there, and I getting in and out of the van it was kind of a pain. So I just drove up to his door, and I was banging on the outside of his door. And he comes out, he looks outside, he sees me in the van, and just walks back in. So uh, I, I, because he's busy, the guy's yeah. always, he's always got projects going on. So I wheel in there, and I said, hey, I don't mean to bother you and stuff. And uh, I said, are you Steve? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then a couple, he, he recognized me, I guess, right off the bat. He's a racing enthusiast. And uh, I said, hey, I got this thing I'm thinking of riding and building this thing. And he was all into it. And that's what I wanted. The enthusiasm was great. So he built the cage. And this is actually a cart seat that I got from the same guys, Mike, that uh, built that cart for me. Uh, and he ended up whipping this thing together. And, Yamaha, I purchased a WR from them and they gave me a great deal on that. Got some YZ parts from a bike that they had to, to tear down. And it's basically a WRZ 450. <laughs> now that you're riding again, I've seen some videos and stuff like that and you look like you're, you're going fast, probably faster than I go. Uh, have you considered doing the Extremity Games and the X Games and uh, racing? Your bike. I think that's what that that would be the next thing for me to do. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to do it. I think it'd be fun. Uh, I enjoy being able to just ride here, uh, to just set up. I'm I'm all set up to go and ride. Excuse me. I have spots on the track that I just pull up against the tree and I could watch guys ride. And, and uh, I'm really set up here to ride. But I think it'd be fun. I heard you saying something about your. Might do the X Games for the snowcross this year for the Extremity Games thing. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, 
This year, my daughter plays volleyball, so I was hanging out in the gym, and I got a phone call from Phil Orleans from ESPN and said, hey, Doug, just wanted to let you know, I don't know if anybody told you yet, but we're going to do a, an adaptive race at this year's Winter X Games with the snowmobiles. And uh, I just, you know, immediately, the wheels are spinning, I'm all excited, you know, and sure enough, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to do. What it is is, I'm not sure how they're working it. At the Summer X Games, they had six amputees and six paraplegics, and they went and raced, had a race for them. Uh, so this year at the Winter X Games, I'm not sure how it's going to work if they're going to invite the same uh, six and six or, or how it's going to work. But I got invited, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm going to try and see if I get Yamaha Monster or, and whoever else could, to sponsor me because going out to Aspen is it's a little more expensive than we thought, staying out there for the, for the week that I'd need to be out there. Um, but I, I found out about a week ago that I'd, I'd also be able to try and compete in the mono skiing, which is something I took up last year and really enjoyed. So hopefully I'd go out there and do some snowmobiling and some skiing and win some races. Has anybody ever approached you about doing like a movie deal about like your life or something like that on the lines of that? Uh, I have had a couple of offers uh, to do a movie. Uh, nothing real, I, I don't know nothing uh, too elaborate, I'm, I'm not sure. N nothing really set in concrete, but just interest. Uh -huh. um, and kind of what I say is I don't feel like I'm ready for a movie. I, I guess it's too much I want to do now. I, I don't, I want to be doing stuff. I don't, to, to do a movie, uh, I feel like there's so much more to be, so much more that I'm going to do. Almost like it's the end if you make the movie. Yeah. Where you're not done yet. Yeah, it could be the, yeah, I, I want to keep going. <laughs> Have you ever considered like an, maybe like an autobiography up to this point about to uh, like help motivate other people who, if not, say, in your situation, just help motivate people in general to, because of all the stuff that you've been through and the, how you've always remained positive and always smiling? And yeah, <laughs> I did, I did start writing a little bit uh, just to kind of keep some note, notes of some experience that I've that I've gone through and, and uh, maybe someday they'll either be put into a movie or a book. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of the privateers that I work with uh, say that you're their, you're their inspiration and hero. Uh, what advice would you have for people that are just starting out with their pro careers and uh, who basically are coming off like what you did with uh, just going in their vans and going to the races and doing whatever they can to make it? Um, I would say go talk to Barry Karsten because <laughs> he's a privateer and he's been doing it all you know for so long. No, I'm I'm just kidding. I, I Barry was a he was a awesome travel mate. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows who Barry Karsten is around anymore, but he was a privateer back when I was starting, and uh, he's still a privateer today, and and uh, he just loves it. And I think that's where it starts is you got to love it. You really got to love what you're doing. If you're not loving it, it's uh, it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, I think uh, you got to try hard. Uh, you just take everything in. I, I've had so many different trainers, and read so many books, and uh, tried so many lines. <laughs> you got to try everything and take it all in. You got to learn every every day. Every day you go riding, you got to try and learn something. If you're having trouble with something, you got to practice it. Someone, someone, I don't know who said it, but don't practice hard, practice smart. Learn every time you go ride. You want to get better, you got to learn how to get better. Uh, and uh, be nice to your parents, because I'm sure they're the ones that are helping you out right now. And they're doing a lot more than you think. Uh, you know, they are. <laughs> I didn't realize how much my parents were doing for me until I became a parent myself and realized, wow. My dad was taking me every weekend, you know. Yeah. So uh, I would say uh, love it. You know, learn to love it. If you're not having a good day, don't, don't, don't try anything that you shouldn't try if you're having a bad day. If you're having a bad day, you have a bad day, go, go do something different. Do something different because you've got to love riding. With the times now and the times where you, you, at, you were at when you were a privateer, do you think it's harder for uh, a privateer 
these days to make it to the level that you reached or do you think it would be harder in your time to the level that you reached? Uh, I think now one advantage that the kids do have is the, the internet and uh, they are able to show a little bit more of themselves and who they are to a company to get a sponsorship as opposed to uh, being on the East Coast trying to get in with companies on the West Coast uh, could be a little tough at times because a, a company only has so much money meaning so, some of the smaller sponsors and, and, and not necessarily the factory teams but uh, it seems like it, out, out on the West Coast there's just a lot a lot more riding it's a lot, it's a lot bigger out there so uh, I think with the internet and the media today uh, you take advantage of that and uh, and use that to your advantage. A lot of fans, a lot of fans want to know how you remain so positive uh, through all the setbacks you've had throughout your motocross career and just all the motorcycle stuff, and how you remain so positive and outgoing and always have a smile on your face. And how do you do it? Um, this is just my positive face. I just wear it when I'm around people. I'm actually a miserable person most of the time. I uh, ask my kids, my wife, I'm really miserable. <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, shoot, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, life is tough, you know, and so what? You know, it's tougher for the next guy, you know. It's, you think your life is bad or rough, and, you know, it's always somebody else got it worse. And you got today, and who knows how many more you're going to have, and it's like, my wife, she would, she would, for a while there, she's like, you got to get angry, you know, you can't just be holding all this stuff in. I'm like, I don't think I'm really holding anything in, you know, if something happens bad to me, I kind of just, you know, hey, it, it happens and kind of move on with it. I, I try not to dwell. It's like, I got today, am I going to waste it being mad at this person or this thing that happened today or whatever? Do I want to be mad? It's like, to me, it's it's not worth it. I don't. I don't want to be angry. I don't. I don't like being angry. If I'm angry, I get angry and it's over. I try to just let it go. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly how I am. Actually, I can't dwell on stuff, even though I have like no money. <laughs> I'm like, oh well, whatever. It could be a lot worse. You know. Um, <clears throat> what's in the future for Doug Henry? What do we? What are you? Do you have any plans with what you're going to do? I know you said you're going to do the X Games and stuff like that. Do you see anything else? Like, do you have any other goals that you want to achieve right now? Anything you, hey. anything you have mapped out? Eli. Angel. So. Well, my future holds. I'm going riding today. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's so what, you know, yeah. hey, that's all I care about. That's what's going on today. I'm going riding. What's happening tomorrow? I don't know, you know, just play a part here. Eli. I I try not to, to look into the future too much. I, I love being in the present. I try and be in the present. I try not to look at the past. I try not to look too much into the future. I really try and enjoy here and now. And uh I'm going I am going to the X Games. Uh what's gonna happen after that? I don't know. I'm I'm doing some some things, uh, getting involved with other disabled people, and uh, who knows where that'll take me, and see where that goes. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> One of the questions that a lot of people ask me is, uh, if a kid, if your kids want to ride, will you let them ride? Um, do they have an interest to ride, or what's the status on that? Not at all. Um, my kids, my kids do ride. Both of them ride a little bit, not much. Uh, my daughter is very, uh, she's a very good rider, very cautious. I like to watch her ride. She's very cautious. You know, she enjoys riding. Just does it for fun. My son rides a little bit more, and he's a little bit on the edge. I'm not. He doesn't. He hasn't had a good crash yet. You know, and I just think one of these days it's going to bite him. Um, but. He, he enjoys riding, but he just does it, rides around the field. Not really much for riding on a track or anything. He's just 
rides up and down the driveway, around the barn, out in the field. And that's a good day riding for him, and that's good for me. I'm, I'm happy with that. If you could do it all over again, from the second you hopped in the truck to go down to Florida to go do the privateer thing, would you do it all over again the same way? Or, or would you, if you could go back in time, would you say, no, you'll take a different road? Uh, <laughs> I would absolutely do it again without a, without a doubt. Uh, would I change anything? Who knows what that would elaborate to, you know, where, where that would go, you know. Breaking my back was, uh, was, an, uh, was an experience the, the first time. It was just an amazing experience of, of, of support you get from people. And then to do it again this time was unbelievable, the support that you get from around the, the world. I never would have saw that. It's, a, it's something that, you know, the ups and downs of, of life, you, you know, you can't have the, the highs without the lows. You know, you can't really experience life without having, everybody's going to have them. You know, whether it's the loved one dying or somebody getting hurt, there's so many illnesses out there. Everybody's going to go through it and uh, just learn from it. And, and it's an experience that that somebody just can't tell you about. Somebody just can't tell you what it's like to be paralyzed. Somebody can't tell you what it's like to, to go through cancer or to have a child that's got a fatal disease. Nobody can tell you what it's like to lose a child. Um, it's these things that are horrible in life and uh, it's a part of life and you, you, make it, you make it what you can. And I forgot what the original question was because I'm going off in the ring. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so I like, get lost. I, got, I tell you, I got, time, I got time to think now. Yeah. I didn't have patience. This wheelchair gave me a lot of patience, which is something. I always said I wish I had more patience. Boom. There it is. Yeah. I wish I didn't say that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of patience and a lot of time to think. And. Uh, a lot of time to, to realize what's important to me, and uh, there's some good in that. There's, there's really, there really is some good in that. Well, you're truly an inspiration to me, and uh, I don't know if you, you definitely don't know, but uh, when I, this very second race I ever went to in my life was at Southwick, and uh, you had just came off winning the national championship in 93, and uh, you actually parked right next to me, and we had no idea because it was my second race. I didn't even know who was the top guys or anything like that at all. And you had the number 16 bike with the uh, with almost like the no smoking sign through it. Yeah, remember that with the circle. With yeah, the, yeah. With Xing out the uh, the six on it, and then uh, you know you, you treated us just like you you know we were family, and uh, you offered us cake. I think it was your birthday that day in your recent South. It was like one of the last South weeks of the year, '93, and I remember it like yesterday. And uh, I was like, I didn't know who this guy was, and I and I was like rolling my 80 down to the track, and, uh, and then all of a sudden I saw you like flying around that corner, and I was like, holy cow, and from like that point on, I pretty much followed your career, and uh, you know, definitely my, my favorite rider by far, so this is a huge, uh, this is a huge day for me to come up to here and uh, talk to you and see your track and see what you have, and it's almost like a, a dream for me to come up and uh, to meet you. Well, I met you before, but uh, to really get your story and you know get all the facts straight and stuff like that. And uh, I think this will be really inspirational to a lot of people, especially the privateers who, you know, they don't know if they want to, they can make it or whatnot. But when they hear your story, they I think it really gives a lot of people motivation, and inspiration. So it's starting to rain, and <laughs> uh, and we're gonna go riding. So. Um, I guess we're going to get geared up and then that's it. Here's the footage for the riding. That was good, I guess. Nice. The ending? Nice. Oh, right? that's good. Yeah. Just, just another th uh, thing for the privateers is uh, I think, you know, you got to believe that you can be out there and be at the top and, and don't think anybody's got an advantage over you. Um, just go out there and, and do your best try hard, work hard, work real hard, and uh, believe in yourself.
think that's that's key. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks.